Well, hey, 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 it's Kim Constable. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. Nobody cares. Work harder. It is Sunday evening. I am getting ahead with the podcast this week because, as I keep saying, I'm finding it very hard to find the time to record the damn thing. So I have decided to get ahead of myself and just sit down and record this podcast and have a wee chat to you all before I go and get settled for the evening because I've just had such a lovely weekend. I've been out riding the horses with my daughter and I have been just spending time with family and my whole team has been struck down with illnesses abscesses, teeth abscesses, um, COVID, flus, colds, literally every single member of my team practically, well, I'd say about 80% of my team have been struck down with some kind of illness. Um, So we've been kind of having like a little bit of a quiet week because of that. And um, I've been working from home a lot and just having a really nice time. So what are we going to talk about today on the podcast? Well, I decided that I'm going to do a QA. and a And why I'm going to do a Q&A? Because I um, get Ask loads of questions on Instagram. People always want to know stuff. And if I'm honest, I kind of ran out of content. It was like, okay, I really don't know what to talk about this week. So a Q&A it is. And so what I did about 30 minutes ago, I put a post on Instagram and I said, I'm going to record a podcast and it's going to be a Q&A. What do you want to know? Um, the top questions will get answered. I'm going to try and get through as many as I possibly can. So hopefully you might find this quite interesting. Um, and before we get to that, though, I need to announce that the winner of what month are we in now? August. The winner of July's podcast giveaway was the lovely Barbara Matsukova. Barbara Matsukova. She won uh, the podcast giveaway with an amazing review. And it was actually sent in by her husband, which was, and it was absolutely hilarious. Um, and he was saying about how, you know, all he ever hears is Kim Constable. He feels like he's married to me, um, except he doesn't mind because his wife is like 30 pounds lighter. So it really was funny. Um, and that was the, was chosen as the winner this month. And and Barbara chose a copy of the 18 Month Sculpt and Shred program as her prize. So congratulations to you, Barbara. Um, your review was hilarious. Thank you to your husband for writing it. And congratulations for winning a program. Okay, so don't forget, by the way, before we get into the content, if you want to win a Sculpted Vegan program, simply leave a review wherever you listen to this podcast. You can't leave them on Spotify for whatever reason. It has to be some other platform. Take a screen grab of the review, send it to me on Instagram at the Sculpted Vegan. We will flag the review and then at the end of the month, we will read through them all and we will choose the best one to win a Sculpted Vegan program. Okay, so I have my phone in my hand. And I'm going to pull up the questions um, that people have asked. And there are lots and lots and lots of them, which is great. So uh, let me just grab a couple. Let me just read through them and see which one is going to be the best one. Um, (laughs) There's some really, really funny ones, which I was like, oh, my God, this is hilarious. So uh, here's here was a really funny question that I was like, am I actually going to answer this in the podcast? So um, it was, have you had any issues with any urine leakage while exercising? What exercises help? Um, so I was <laughs> laughing whenever that one came through. I was like, am I actually going to answer this in the podcast? But you know what? Fuck it. Let's just answer it and see how we go. Have I ever had any issues with any urine leakage while exercising? No, the only time I've ever leaked urine is on the trampoline. Um, and I didn't actually leak any. I just thought that I was going to pee myself. You know that feeling that whenever you're jumping up and down and you actually think you're going to wet yourself? That was several years ago. But no, I've never had any um, any issues with that recently. I don't even know anything about it. I do know there is like a, you can get like a prolapse, a prolapsed bladder, I think. It does sometimes happen to older women um, who are in menopause. Fucking menopause is to blame for everything. So, but I personally have never had any experience of it. I have to be honest. So I'm really sorry that isn't something that I can um, advise with, but probably the reason why I haven't had any issues with anything like that is because I do so much pelvic floor activation whenever I am lifting. So if you go and listen to one of the podcast episodes, I can't remember which one it is, um, but it's about how to, um, how something about alleviating back pain. I don't know what it's called, but anyway, we will link to it in the show notes. Um, So it's about, you know, how to, you know, this tip or whatever for alleviating back pain while squatting. And in that podcast, I teach a a technique called the vagina smoothie sucking technique, which I have coined. Um, It isn't actually mine. I got it from a yogi friend of mine years ago. Um, And it's basically to imagine that you are sucking a, a smoothie through a straw, 
using your vagina um, and that activates your transverse abdominis, also known as your TVA, which is what you should turn on every single time you are lifting, especially when you're deadlifting, squatting or doing any kind of leg exercises. But um, it is a really, really good tip for turning on the TVA. And I think that because I do so much turning on of my TVA, my vaginal muscles are really, really, really strong. Sorry if you're a guy listening to this, talking about my vaginal muscles and all that. But you know, this stuff needs to be talked about. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to clear my throat. So, um, yeah, so I think that the stronger you keep your muscles, the stronger you keep yourself down there, um, the better it will be. And I actually have to tell you a funny story. My sister came back from a conference. One of my sister has, um, she developed, created and developed a product called the Babo Kush, which is a, um, a, a, it's a revolutionary baby chair where the baby lies on its tummy um, and on, on this like vibrating cushion and it um, soothes colic and wind and reflux and stuff. And it's this absolutely amazing product. But anyway, she went away to a conference in Germany and she came back with this, this product that had just been developed and it was like a shape of an egg and you're supposed to I think it was a shape of an egg you're supposed to like insert it into your vagina and then you download this app from the, from the app store and you have you're supposed to like do like squeezes and pulses and uh, different things in time to the app so the app like flashes and you're supposed to like you know squeeze 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 hold you know this kind of stuff and uh, I think they have like beginner intermediate and advanced workouts uh, we were in absolute stitches reading about it it was so funny so so if you're really interested in doing some kind of exercises for your vagina, then, uh, you know, that's like vagina gym. Yep, vagina gym. You can go to vagina gym and you can strengthen those muscles and then you probably won't pee while you're lifting. But it isn't something I've ever experienced. I apologize, but definitely do work on strengthening those muscles if this is something that you suffer from. Okay, so Nicola McLean is asking uh, the next question. Uh, she says, I've been on a fitness journey for quite some time and I love it. I've just done my first solo fitness fitness shoot. Brilliant experience. As my next goal, I've toyed with doing a show. Would you recommend it and can it be done naturally? So Nicola, that's a really great, great question. Would I recommend doing a show? Um, yes, if you're that way inclined, I absolutely would recommend doing a show, but not for the goal of standing on stage in a sparkly bikini, but more for the goal of building the discipline, self-esteem, the um, self-belief, the emotional muscles, your, as well as your physical muscles, all, there's so much more goes in to uh, doing a show than just building muscle and shredding body fat. Because in order to stay disciplined to the process of building muscle, you have to show up to the gym four or five days a week. You have to get out of bed when you don't feel like it. You have to go when you're tired. You have to dig deep and find the motivation to just show up every day because motivation only really lasts so long and then discipline keeps you going. So motivation gets you going and discipline will keep you going. And then whenever you get to the stage where you're ready to diet for a show, the first couple of weeks are easy. But then as you get longer and further into your diet and your calories are really low and you know you you're working towards this show and you've got the sparkly bikini to wear and you know you're going to stand on stage and hundreds or thousands of people are going to be looking at you you it's that's motivation to keep going but you have to you have to develop self-discipline so that you don't cheat on your diet you don't skip your cardio and you show up to the stage in the best possible shape that you can and you know, it's it's hard. Building muscle is easy because you're eating loads of food and you're, you know, showing up. All you have to do is push really hard in the gym. And yes, it's tiring and it's time consuming and you have to show up every day. But the dieting is the really hard part because not only do you still have to show up to the gym every day and push just as hard as you were pushing, you now have to do it on reduced calories and calorie restriction. And I never drank while I was dieting ever. Now, whenever I'm dieting, I do enjoy a drink on the weekend because I'm not dieting for any specific reason. So, but whenever I was dieting for a show, like I literally did not drink from Christmas until April. So, and I, you know, I was very, very, very strict with my diet. And, you know, so you, you turn into a bit of a boring bitch, I have to be honest. Like nobody wants to invite you places anywhere. If you go out, you usually bring your own food or you just don't go out. And, you know, you're not drinking and you just, you know, your friends, and family are like, God, you're so boring. And this is like, you know, so not so, you know, you're just not fun anymore. And so you have to develop a real mental fortitude, a physical fortitude, an emotional fortitude, and a mental fortitude. Emotional and mental are kind of the same thing, but you get the drift. So definitely for that reason, 
I would recommend doing a show. And I remember whenever I was, you know, prepping for shows, there was one particular year, it was 2018. And I remember dieting really, really hard for um, for a show. I was actually being prepped by my previous prep coach, Curtis, who is our head trainer, Laura's ex-husband, a funny story there. And I was being prepped by him and he preps much different than Mark Getty. So whenever I say you're being prepped by someone, usually if you're going to do a show, you have a coach and that coach will design your diet and your training and they will, you'll send them weekly photos and they'll say, yes, either up your calories or reduce your calories or keep things the same. So they will look at your progress and they will make the, the decisions based on your progress because you can't always be trusted to be objective whenever it comes to your own progress. And so I was um, being prepped by Curtis, but Curtis preps very differently than Mark. He had me doing um, an hour's cardio in the morning and then he had me doing training in the gym but in between training sessions he had me doing hit training so this is um the 12 week shred my program the 12 week shred is actually based on the prep that curtis had me do which was actually the hardest prep i've ever done in my life because i was having to do really heavy sets in the gym but then i was doing um you know like squat jumps and i was doing you know uh, battle ropes and and all these different things in between my weight sessions and oh fucking hell it was an absolute nutter killer and so I remember, though, of dropping my calories and I got down to 1300 calories. It was in the last two weeks, I think. And I, I dropped and I said to Curtis, well, I dropped to 1300. And he said, do you think you can cope? And I said, yeah, it's fine. I can cope. It's great. It's no problem. You know, and so I dropped the 1300 calories, which was really quite low for me. And I remember I used to go into Starbucks to get coffee. So I still would allow myself within my macros a an oat milk flat white. I never drank black coffee. It just, it felt like a dessert for me having an oat milk flat white. And I remember going into Starbucks. My parents and all came over from Australia and you know, I was two or three weeks out from my show. I think it was about three weeks out from my show or four weeks out maybe whenever they came over. And I remember going out with me and my mother-in-law for coffee and we would go into say Starbucks, whatever. And I would look at the, the cheesecakes and I would look at the pastries and I would look at the brownies and I would just be like every bone in my body wanted one. And I'm vegan, right? And half the stuff there wasn't vegan. And I was looking at the cheesecake going, if someone set that cheesecake down in front of me, I'd fucking eat it. I would eat it. Like, I don't give a shit about being vegan. I, like, if, you, if you've ever had a baby, you get to the final stages of labor, right? And you have this birth plan in your mind. You're like, I want to have a natural birth. And I just want to have music playing in the background and the sweet sound of, of you know, of, of, of the water running. And, and my husband's going to be there with me. And then you get into like, hard labor and you're like just give me all the drugs just give me the epidural this is a fucking care it's a cesarean just get this fucker out of me like you everything goes out the window that's kind of what it was like whenever i was prepping okay i was like you know just give me the cheesecake of course i never add it right now i used to look at it all the way up the counter and i used to go i'm just gonna order one i'm just gonna order one i'm just gonna order i'm gonna order one. i'm gonna order a brownie i'm gonna order a cheesecake i was so fucking starving all the time and then i would get to the counter i would go can i have a notebook flat white please and I would like clamp my mouth shut. I would hold my lips shut. I would literally forbid myself from saying any more. And they, they would look at me a bit strangely and they would be like, uh, is that all? And I'd be like, uh, yep, that, yep, that's all. Thanks. And every fiber of my soul was going, order the cheesecake, order the cheesecake. But of course, I never let myself order the goddamn cheesecake. So, you know, so it is, it's, it's really, really, really hard to do, to diet for a show because you can't let yourself off the hook. You have to be super disciplined. And let me tell you, the only way you get down to 10 to 12 percent body fat which is what you need to be to stand on stage is to diet really hard to diet really hard to deprive yourself to count your calories to be disciplined it and it's tough it's not fucking easy so should everyone do a show if they want to absolutely they should but not to get really super lean not to stand on stage in a sparkly bikini but because of the self-esteem and the self-belief that you build doing a show because it is one of the hardest things you'll ever do of course it gets easier and easier the more you do it and you know and then you know the wee tweaks to make and where you can have a little bit of this or have a little bit of that but in the beginning whenever you're just learning you have to be super disciplined if you're so your first couple of shows are actually always the hardest it does get easier per se the more you do because you become more experienced but they, yes really 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 hard you have to dig deep and find the motivation to keep going and I absolutely think that everybody should do that okay Kay Fenlon has our next question and she says do you eat differently on a rest day so this is a good question and and the answer is yes and no so 
and it's kind of a three part answer. So I'll give you the first one. Whenever I'm dieting and I'm on a rest day, then yes, I eat differently. So when I say dieting, I mean, whenever I'm prepping for a show, then yes, I eat differently on a rest day. So I'm very, very strict on my calories during the week. But on a rest day, I will always couple that with a higher carbohydrate day because whenever you are on low calories and you increase your carbohydrates on your rest day, it resets your leptin levels. So leptin is the hormone that regulates metabolism and ghrelin is the hormone that regulates hunger. And so if you reset your leptin levels with a high carbohydrate day, that means that you will your metabolism will not drop and you will continue to, to lose body fat, but also you will never never lose your menstrual cycle. People always ask me, did I ever lose my menstrual cycle, especially when I got down to really super low body fat? And I never did. And that was because I always had high carbohydrate days to reset my leptin levels because leptin is the hormone responsible for metabolism, which is the hormone responsible for your, your menstrual cycle. So the only reason why girls or athletes would lose their menstrual cycle is if they're not balancing their diet with high carbohydrates. And many people don't know that. Um, and so they just think it's like a freak of nature, but it's not. It's perfectly controllable. You never have to lose your menstrual cycle. So yes, I eat differently on rest days whenever I'm dieting. That's when I will have high carbohydrates. What what does that mean? Well, I'll have you know oats for breakfast. Um, I'll maybe have a bagel mid morning. Um, I'll definitely usually have some kind of vegan burger with a you know a white uh, burger bun and maybe some sweet potato fr- uh, baked sweet potato fries on the side. So something quite high carb just to reset the um, the leptin levels. Now, whenever I'm not dieting and I'm kind of just cruising or in a build, not even in a building phase, but just cruising, then I don't really have, you know, my my eating doesn't change. My eating stays consistent all through the week. But of course, on the weekend, I usually will go out for breakfast with my family or go out for dinner with my family. And I will usually eat a little more, something a little more indulgent. But that isn't because like, it's not like, oh, it's the weekend, I'm going to indulge. It's just because during the week, my my meals stay pretty consistent because we have a private chef who works for us. And Lee actually cooks all of our food and he has it um, macro and calorie counted during the week. So during the week, all of our food is macro and calorie counted simply because it helps me to keep control of my macros and my calories. And on the weekend, it's not like Lee leaves food in the fridge, but I don't really count macros in the weekend. I just eat whatever I feel like I want to eat. I just eat intuitively, but I very rarely go nuts and eat like, you know, heaps and heaps of food. Um, But if I do like today, I actually was hungry. And so I had a little more food today. So in the weekend, I always relax a little bit more. Um, And then a rest day. So the, so that's what I was going to say. So normally whenever I'm just cruising, my food stays the same. But at the minute, my life has settled into a pattern of, like I said, Lee, our chef, um, he, he counts our macros during the week and macros and calories. And I actually have my macros set really low at the minute during the week. And the reason for this is because now when I say low, I Lee counts my macros in at 1400 calories. So during the week, Monday to Friday, I'm only eating 1400 calories, 1400 counted calories. And that includes the oat, mil- oat milk that I put in my coffees. And now you may go, oh my God, that's really, really low. Well, yes, it is, except that I do make up for it in the weekend. So eating 1400 calories five days a week, and I can have more food if I want, by the way, like that, that that's very low for me. So if I feel like I want to have some toast in the evening or a toasted bagel or some extra protein, then I just go ahead and do that. So keeping my food consistently low, this is how I eat intuitively now, keeping my calories consistently low during the week, one stops Lee throwing like all kinds of fats into my food because chef chefs love to cook with like vegan butters and vegan creams and avocados and all this kind of stuff you know they love to throw the flavor in there but unfortunately fortunately flavor is super calorific so um that sounded like i was gonna say super califragilistic expialidocious but um so i keep them at 1400 calories during the week and then on the weekend i love having some champagne on the weekend or some beer and i like to take the kids for vegan ice cream or we have pizza or whatever so usually on the weekend then my calories will be far higher i mean i I could be eating 4,000 calories a day on Saturday and Sunday, easily sometimes. And so it balances out over a seven day period. Many people don't know that when you work out your daily calories, you're actually working them out over a seven day period. So if you use one of those online calculators, say one of our online calculators, um, which you can get by the way, at sculptedvegan.com forward slash macro hyphen calculator, we'll link to it in the show notes. So if you go to our macro calculator and you put in how, you know, it'll ask you for your height, your weight, your body fat, your age, and then it'll say, you know, how many days a week do you exercise? 
size for how many minutes and it will also um, ask you what your job's like and that kind of stuff and then it will give you your daily calorie count well how it works out your daily calorie count is by working out your calorie count over seven days and then dividing it by seven so if you if you're if you're burning 14,000 calories a week it will give you 2,000 calories a day. Now, here's the genius in that, right? If you take 500 calories per day over five days, that's 2,500 calories, right? So if you eat 1,500 calories Monday to Friday and you put those 2,500 calories onto Saturday and Sunday, you're not eating over your weekly TDEE, so you won't actually gain weight. If you eat less during the week, you can you can actually add up your calories on the weekend because it's over a seven day period that your calories are counted. So that's what I've always done. That's what I do now to maintain. I eat less during the week. I eat more on the weekend. And it means that I stay consistently lean all year round. And people always say to me, I think one of the questions someone's asked here is, how do you manage to drink alcohol and still stay so lean? That's how. Alcohol is extremely calorific. There's there's over a thousand calories in a bottle of wine. There's 220 calories in a glass of white wine. There's six glasses in a bottle, which means that uh, two sixes are 18, which is like 2,180 calories, okay, in a bottle of wine. And I would sometimes drink a full bottle of champagne to myself on a Friday if we have, you know, friends over or neighbors over or sometimes some champagne, then some beer. So I'm drinking 1,120 calories <laughs> by myself, you know, without even eating any food on the weekend. And so that is how I drink alcohol and still stay lean because I'm managing my calories during the week. Calorie um, intake or managing your weight is simply an equation of calories in versus calories out. So I'm expending calories by training five days a week, doing cardio five days a week and keeping my calories low, which means I have the weekend to play with. And I've always loved to work hard during the week and then play in the weekend. I don't usually train on the weekend, although my husband and I have started training on a Sunday now, we train chest and triceps, but I don't normally train on the weekend. I just spend the weekend with my family, eating, drinking, having fun, and I don't mind being disciplined during the week in order to do it. So um, great question, and I hope that that was a full and comprehensive answer and that you enjoyed it. I really enjoy doing Q&As, actually. I think they're... Um, they are a fantastic um, thing to do. Oh, there's my uh, there's my trainer, Mark Getty. The Irish Hulk has said, are you missing me yet? Mark, you won't be listening to this, but yes, I am missing you. Mark has been away for three weeks and I was away for two weeks before that. So I haven't trained leg with, Mark's for five week, for Mark, with Mark for five weeks. And I'm really kind of dreading my leg day with Mark whenever I do get back to it, but um, kind of looking forward to it at the same time because that's how you build and keep big legs. Okay, what else have we got here? Let me just do a couple of quick fire ones. Uh, Shannon King is asking, um, oh, hang on, Nicola didn't ask, hang on, she said, can it be done naturally? That was that was the last part of the question for doing a show. So I just want to go back to that. Nicola, yes, of course it can be done naturally. You don't need to take drugs to do a show. You don't need to take steroids to do a show, especially if you're competing in bikini. If you're competing in the bigger categories, then yes, you probably do need some um, chemical help because you really as a woman can't build that amount of muscle but if you're just competing in bikini then you do not need chemical help at all you can absolutely do it naturally just wanted to finish off by saying that um okay shannon king is asking um how do you deal with stress chronically stressed and it affects my gut and inflammation etc so here's the thing i don't really get stressed um i i do run a very very busy company and sometimes i do have a lot of um a lot of it, you know, like just before I went away on vacation, we launched the Million Dollar Mentor and it was a very, very fast launch that we did. And I was getting up at 4 a.m. every day to plan the launch. And then we had a two week, a three week launch period, actually. And I was doing a lot of interviews for the Platinum Mastermind I was running. And it was just crazy. It was full, full, full on. But um I, I, and that was me stressed, I would say. But how do I deal with stress? I train. Whenever you train, whenever you make time to move your body and clear your mind, then stress cannot build up in the body. Stress only becomes chronic if you allow it to manifest and and keep it and hold within within its but within your body. So a lot of people, whenever they um, whenever their fight or flight is triggered, which is what happens when you're stressed, your adrenals start to pump adrenaline into your body. You need a way to release that adrenaline. If you don't release that adrenaline, it does get stored in your system and it can affect you know your your tissues and your organs and your gut and all of those things. So you need to train and you need to train hard. Years ago, whenever I I was actually in a 
a relationship with a guy and I what well, I was happy but I kind of wasn't happy towards the end and we used to fight a lot and so every time I felt frustrated or angry or um or whatever with him I used to go running I used to just I used to take to the streets and go pound the streets and I used to run about 30 miles a week and it was such a great stress reliever for me because whenever I came in from a run, I felt like I couldn't even remember why I was angry with him anymore because it had completely released it from my body. So state control or or actively changing your state is one of the best ways you can deal with stress. What you have to realize is you can choose to indulge the stress or you can choose to do something to turn it off. But unfortunately, many of us actually enjoy feeling stressed. Um, we enjoy the feeling of it. It helps us to feel purposeful or helps us to feel like, you know, we're doing something to change something or or we just get caught in this loop, this amplification loop of I feel stressed and I don't feel like I can do anything about it. So I feel more stressed and I don't feel like I feel more stressed. And so we just amplify it. So in order to get out of the amplification loop, what do you need what you need to do is go to the gym. You need to lift really heavy, leave your soul in the gym floor, take up running, do or yoga or meditation, do something. Okay. You are not an, at the effect of your body. You can choose differently. Whether you do choose differently or not is completely up to you, but you can. And sometimes just knowing you can and then just actively taking steps to changing your physiology is the best way to release stress. So whenever, um, even whenever I'm really, really, really busy, I prioritize sleep. I prioritize a wind down routine in the evening and I still get up every single morning and I keep my routine. I walk for 60 minutes and I train hard in the gym and that is consistent. I never, ever, ever change that. So you have to find something that is a great stress reliever for you and commit to it as much as you are committed to feeling stressed because believe me as much as you might not want to think you are we are committed to feeling stressed because we are not or we're committed to anything anything which happens consistently in our life that we can change but choose not to i.e if you're not a slave if you if you're not enslaved by someone in that your freedom has been taken away then you are free to choose anything you're not a victim of your life so if you're feeling stressed you need to change it and you just need to figure out ways that you can and that's the best way to manage it and deal with it. And that's what I figured out years ago. Okay. What else have we got here? Um, favorite cardio workout, Shaka as well, wellness is asking. So for just kind of general feel-good cardio, walking outside uh, with my husband and my dog, preferably, is my favorite cardio. So every morning at about 8 a.m., my husband and I go for a walk with Buddy, the dog, and we walk for about six kilometers and takes us almost exactly 60 minutes. Uh, we do about a kilometer every 10 minutes um, and it's a brisk walk. My heart rate is at about 130 and it's really enjoyable and we put the world to rights and we talk about our relationship and we talk about the kids and we you know have really in-depth conversations philosophical conversations and I really love it and Buddy gets exercise at the same time um the most effective cardio workout however is the Stairmaster I have a Stairmaster in my gym and whenever I get on the Stairmaster for an hour I literally clock watch from about 30 minutes in I'm like when is this going to be over and I am dripping with sweat and my heart rate stays at about 143. So an hour on the Stairmaster burns about 150 more calories than an hour walking with the dog. So it is a more effective workout. So if I'm looking for more, a more effective cardio workout, I will use the Stairmaster. If I'm looking for a more enjoyable cardio workout, then I go for a walk with Ryan and Buddy. Or if Ryan's not with me, I just put in my AirPods and I listen to a podcast while I'm walking. Or sometimes I don't listen to anything. Sometimes I just walk and think because I love walking and thinking. It's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, favorite vacation spot somebody else is asking um goodness probably at the minute i love going to the marbella club in spain it's where we go frequently um it's a uh, one of the leading hotels of the world um it's a really short plane ride like our we live eight minutes from the airport not even eight minutes like four minutes from the airport so um you can be in the car and literally be in the airport in four minutes so it's a small airport too it's only a three-hour flight so you watch a movie on the flight and have a gin and tonic and you're there in spain and then it's a 25 minute car ride from the airport to the marbella club so it is so quick to get there and the hotel is just out of this world i mean it is spectacular it's expensive like if you're gonna go just the two of you like our room last we we didn't even get a suite but we got like a beachfront room. normally we do get a suite but 
this time we just got one of the beautiful beachfront rooms um, and it was like a basic room will cost you, well, the beachfront ones are a bit more expensive, cost you like £10,000 for the week. I'm not even joking. So seven nights stay will cost you £10,000. So it's over £1,000 a night to stay. So it is expensive. Um, and then, of course, you have to pay for all your food and your drink and everything when you're there, um, which is probably another for two of you, another two grand on top of that. So it is it is an expensive vacation, but it is absolutely worth it because you are so taken care of on every single level. And I just feel so relaxed whenever I come home from it. So that is absolutely my favorite um, vacation spot. Um, okay, L. Biaz is asking, do you get excited every morning to train or do you just want it to be over? Um, I don't ever get excited to train. No, never. I never, ever, ever think, oh my God, I'm so excited to train. Ever. Um, this morning I said to Ryan, God, I'm such a whingy bitch this morning. I woke up this morning and I just was feeling not on my A game and I didn't even drink yesterday. Well, I did. I had like a tequila. I didn't have like a, a margarita um, at dinner and then I had one bottle of beer when I got back. So I can't even say that like I was hungover and I think because it wasn't, I didn't really get hungover. I just get like a wee kind of a heavy head. But um, yeah, so I just woke up and I really wasn't feeling that great. And Ryan said, right, you know, come on, we need to go walking and then train because I have to go and collect Kai. And I said, well, if you have to collect Kai, we don't have time to walk. We'll just have to eat breakfast and train because, you know, you're not going to have enough time to do both. So he said, all right, okay, no problem. And so we, um, I went down to the kitchen and I was like, oh my God, I don't feel like this. And I wasn't even hungry because I hadn't walked. So my routine was all out. And I was like, oh, what am I going to eat? And I, had, I made a protein shake and it was, I put too much ice in it because I forgot I was only making it for me and not making it for everyone. And then it was like, I don't even want to drink that. And and then I was like, oh God, what am I going to have? I don't have enough time to scramble tofu. And But then I found some scrambled tofu in the fridge and I had that on toast. And I was just like, oh, but I knew that we were going to the gym. And Ryan was all, he was all in his A game this morning. He was like, yeah. And he was all happy and like slapping me and I think he was horny to be honest and so he's all like poking me and prodding me and I was like fuck off like leave me alone you know I was like one of those mornings trying not to be like a real grumpy bitch but I really was feeling like a grumpy bitch so we went into the gym but I knew that once I started training I would be fine and of course I just I just lay down on the machine and I just started to move the bar and we were training chest and triceps and I ended up having an absolutely great workout today like really really good and it, you know it was it was fine I felt so much better afterwards and then I took my daughter to ride the horses and stuff and so the point is no I never feel like draining ever like especially when it's legs I'm like oh my god I feel really vomity whenever it's at legs because I know I have like the fear because I know that I'm going to be like literally leave my soul on the gym floor and be training so fucking hard so um, but you just do it like we have our morning routine and I think the thing about lifting is you have to get into a routine if you're not in a routine it's really hard if you leave it to chance and you're like, oh, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll train later on. And, you know, anytime I don't, if Ryan's not training with me and I think, oh, yeah, I'll train, I'll train later. It never happens. Training later never happens. So you have to train in the morning. So, you know, our routine is we walk at 8 a.m. We're back here by nine. Lee, our chef, usually has our breakfast ready. So we eat breakfast and then we're you and then Ryan comes down and he makes coffee and I make up a big bottle of BCAA water that we we share and we have um, an espresso. We have like a macchiato espresso, espresso topped with hot oat milk. We drink that. We pick up our bottle of water and we're in the gym by 9.30. And so we train 9.30 to 10.30. And because we have each of us, and he's going, come on, hurry up, Busby. Busby's my maiden name. That's what he calls me. Come on, Busby, come on. And I'm like, I'm coming, hurry up. You know, so I'm not like bouncing into the gym all excited ever. I go in, I'm like, oh, I can't be arsed with this. But see, once you picked up your first couple of weights, your first couple of sets, I don't do any warm up or anything. Like my first sets are my warm up. So Sometimes you've moved the bar a few times and, you know, you, you start to get into the way of it. And also you have a state change. When I walk into my gym, my gym has a very distinct smell because we have rubber flooring and it's just a beautiful, beautiful gym. It's absolutely immaculately kitted out. And whenever I walk in there and I smell the gym, I have like a state change. I have a physiology change. The smell triggers my gym state. It triggers those that that part of me that goes, yeah, we can do this, you know. So that's what they always say. Going to the gym is the getting to the gym is the hardest part. Once you're there and you walk in and you smell the sweat and you smell the gym and you may as well train whenever you're there. You know, it's 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 easy once you're there. The hardest part is actually getting there. So make sure that you, if you want to keep up a consistent gym routine, that you find a way to be consistent. Get a partner that you train with. That you don't want to let them down or set it as you know have. A set time that you go to the gym every single day, even if it's a gym in your home basement or your home garage, you 
want to make sure you're training at exactly the same time every day and it's written into your calendar. So if someone says, you know, oh, do you want to do this at 7 p.m.? You go, no, I can't because I'm training. People say to me all the time, oh, can I meet with you at this time or whatever? And I'll be like, no, because I train 10 to 11 or 9.30 to 10.30. It is now. I, nope, I train 9.30 to 10.30. That's my my gym time is sacred. No one ever schedules a meeting with me at that time. Susie, my assistant, knows to never put a meeting in in the morning because I train 9.30 to 10.30 and it's a non-negotiable no matter how busy I am. If I'm busy, then I work later in the evenings or I work on the weekends, but 9.30 to 10.30 is non-negotiable for me. That is my training time. And that is how you make it happen. Okay, uh, Mel McKeag is asking, how do you balance drinking alcohol and staying shredded? P.S. I love you. Well, I love you too, Mel. Thank you so much for asking that. And I kind of covered this a wee bit earlier, you know, um, drinking alcohol and staying shredded. You, It's all about how you manage your calories because like I talked about, you know, earlier, and I hope you were listening earlier, which you probably are because it's a podcast and everybody listens all the way through. So if you balance your, your calories by, um, by keeping them lower during the week, but you have to count them in order for this to work, you have to count your calories during the week. You can't just wing it. Okay. I make sure that I'm getting adequate protein, adequate fats, adequate carbs during the week. Yes. I'm only having 1400 calories, but 45% of those 1400 calories is protein. I'm going to say it again. 45% of those 1400 calories is protein. 25% is fat and 30% is carb. So I'm getting, I will have two protein shakes a day. I'll have a hundred grams in the morning, sorry, 50 grams in the morning after training and 50 grams in the evening. That makes up 100 grams of protein before I've even eaten any food. That's how I keep my protein intake so high. So then the other um, 100 grams or whatever it is I'm eating comes from the food that I'm eating. So by keeping my protein high, it means I keep fuller for longer. It means I can have lower calories during the week, which means that I have room for alcohol on the weekend. And I can I can actually still diet and drink alcohol because I'm still in a calorie deficit. And I never, although I do drink frequently, everybody on my Instagram always goes, fucking hell, she drinks so much. I I drink frequently, but I don't drink an enormous amount. And I know I've, I said earlier, like I drink a bottle of champagne, but like I don't always drink a full bottle. Sometimes only like two or three glasses. Um, and so it, it, there's sometimes if I have beer, I'll have maybe three beers and we drink this beer called Modest Beer. So it's like there's no uh, sulfites in it. It's a really pure beer. It's locally brewed. It's only 4%. So it doesn't have a lot of alcohol. So I'm not drinking like hard liquor. If I'm drinking gin and tonics, I'll maybe have four, sometimes five gin and tonics. But like you're talking over a period of say, you know, five hours. Like I went out for dinner with my friend the other night um, and we were there for like, we met at 4.30 and we didn't get home until nearly nine. And over that period of time, which was uh, four and a half hours, I, we, ha we had a bottle of champagne and a bottle of wine and we shared them. So I basically had one full bottle of champagne, but that was over four hours, four and a half hours. So that was six glasses over four and a half hours, which is just slightly over one glass per hour. So whenever you think about it, it's not like I'm binge drinking, I'm not knocking back a bottle within an hour. I'm eating food. And I also drank, we drank a liter of water each in those four hours. In fact, I think I drank a liter and a half. So I'm drinking a liter and a half of water as well. So you have, that's how I don't get, like, get hangovers. I constantly drink sparkling water. So for every glass of alcohol I have, I will have a glass of water. Whenever we went away uh, recently, I took my whole family, my sisters and their husbands away to London for the weekend. We stayed in the Mandarin Oriental. It was beautiful. We had the most gorgeous lunches and dinners. Um, in these beautiful restaurants. And I was just constantly bring the water, you get a bottle of still, bottle of sparkling, another bottle of still, another bottle of sparkling. The water was just flowing. And so at every single meal, yes, we were drinking a lot of alcohol, but I, I probably had a liter to two liters of water by myself at the dinner table. So whenever you're drinking heaps and heaps and heaps of water, you never get hung over because water is actually, um, it's the dehydration that causes you to be hung over. So if you never let yourself get dehydrated, you never get hung over. And whenever you're keep constantly flushing the water through your body, your liver can cope and you know, it, it's absolutely, it, it works. But a lot of people who suffer from hangovers or suffer from ill effects of alcohol don't drink enough water. So you have to drink water, you have to eat food and just kind of drink in moderation as well. I do drink frequently. Sometimes I'll have a, a you know, a glass of wine on a Wednesday and then another one or two on a Friday and then maybe one on a Saturday as well. So I do drink frequently, but I don't drink a massive amount and I very rarely drink. I never drink when I'm dieting for a show, but I haven't done any shows in a while. So I've been drinking frequently. Uh, okay. Let me see. 39 minutes in a few more, a few more, a few, uh, some time for a few more questions. So what is the next big thing you are working towards and why Shaka Wellness is asking me? 
So we have many big things that we're working towards. Uh, let me just tell you, uh, probably the biggest thing that we're working towards at the minute is the Sculpted Vegan app, which we thought would be ready in June. But I think that um, the guy, uh, the app developer, who actually is um, my sister, in my stepsister's partner, hopefully soon to be fiance and then husband, um, he, I think he underestimated the size of the job. Well, two things I think happened. I think he underestimated the size of the job. And secondly, he's a complete and utter perfectionist. So he can't help but keep perfecting and perfecting and perfecting it. But adding on the programs has actually been the the most time consuming part because the app is now ready and working and functional and we all have it in our phones testing it so I can log into it anytime and test it. But where um, where the, or the most time consuming part is we have heaps and heaps and heaps of programs on our website. You know, we have the four week shred, the 12 day holiday shred, the one week shred, the 12 week shred, the 18 month sculpting shred. Um, we have, oh God, I can't think of so many words. So we have basement jacked and the eight week butt camp and buns and guns and we have meal plans and we and and the, we have the band shred we have so many programs and so we're adding all of these things onto the app which takes an awful lot of time because what we want to happen is whenever someone downloads the app it'll say have you bought a sculpted vegan program before and you'll say yes and then it'll say what was the email that you used to purchase and you type in your email and then we will send you a code and then you come back to the app put in that code and ta-da all the programs that you have previously purchased will be loaded into the app which is amazing. And you'll also be able to browse all the other programs in there and just with a little double click of your thumb, purchase them if you want to, which is an absolute game changer. So the app um, is the next big thing. I don't know when it's going to be completely ready. It really just depends on Ross. So Ross is the, the guy who was developing the app really excitingly Ross has now um, agreed to come on board full time he's starting 1st of September full time as chief technology officer of my company and he is actually bringing um another guy uh with him who I think his name is Darren I haven't even met him but Ross has has interviewed him and trained him and is bringing him with him too so our tech team is expanding hugely and they are coming on board and Alan is going to be still in charge of design uh, but he's moving out of the CTE role Alan is moving out of the CTO role and into design and Ross is going to be doing CTO and he's going to be developing the app and the website so the app is probably the next biggest thing that we are launching um, I'm also at the minute digging into a partnership with the Protein Works, who I am affiliated with who I absolutely love but we're actually exploring a joint branded partnership at the minute where we are actually going to brand the products with a sculpted vegan and do a profit share on them. So I was going to develop my own range of protein and supplements, but what I've realized is I just love the protein works and I just don't want to change. And so I approached the CEO and the founder and I said to him, would you be interested in exploring this? So I think he and he and I, he absolutely was on board with that. So what I would love is for the protein works to be available inside the app as well. So whenever people buy a program, we can say, would you like to purchase the supplements that come with this program? You can purchase one week or two weeks or all four weeks um, and with discounts, obviously. So that's what I'd love to happen. Um, the other really exciting thing is Aura Ring that I talk about a lot, Aura, O-U-R-A. Um, my whole family and my whole team wear Aura Rings. We are, I have actually just invested in Aura Rings. So I give them a big chunk of cash um, a while ago and I have been now in talks with Aura Ring and we want to be able to offer the Aura Ring inside the app as well. So you can purchase it inside the app and also that you can do all your Aura Ring tracking. And this is going to be an absolute game changer because one of the other things that we're launching is the menopause program. So Laura, my head trainer, is a menopause expert. She studied it extensively over the years. She's done training programs and she's actually just um, done another certification. She actually is developing a menopause program at the minute, which we are releasing in, hmm, I want to say October. I'm not 100% sure um, and it's not going to be expensive but it is going to be an absolute game changer and Laura is also going to be coaching during it as well she's going to be coaching the people who purchase it so um, we want to be able to, uh, sorry, the Aura Ring is amazing for tracking your temperature and your sleep and all of those things to do with menopause. So we want to we want to bring this all together. App, Aura Ring, protein supplements, you know, menopause, world fucking domination, actually. That's, that's what it is. I'm building a conglomerate. <laughs> and then the other really exciting thing that we have, apart from the new programs that we're releasing, which is eight week abs, 10 pull ups in 10 weeks, five pounds in five days. We have all of these cracking new programs uh, that we are releasing. We are also launching a range of apparel. So my sister Kerry works for me now um, full time and she is, she's the one who developed Babakush I talked about earlier and she is now working as a consultant with the company helping me to devenge 
to uh, sorry to launch our full range of apparel. We're doing scrunch bum leggings. We're doing sports bras and you know cut off t shirts, but real bodybuilding stuff. I have gone to town on the design of this. I don't want it to be just like you know off the shelf stuff. We're not buying from catalogs in China. We are developing and designing our own range and having it made with a company in London, uh, probably in China actually. But that's the best way to get them mass produced. But we're being so fussy because I know exactly what I want and how I want the glutes to look and how I want this. Uh, uh, stuff this uh, apparel to shape the body the sportswear to shape the body and that's going to be launching as well soon so oh my god it's all go 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 um and i love uh i love the fact that we have such a strong community and everybody's like always oh, waiting for the next thing that we're launching and everyone's like with me on this really exciting crazy fucking journey of like you know if you think about it guys four years ago i was a yoga teacher Four years ago, I had never stepped foot in a gym. In fact, that's not true. 2016, was, I think, was when I first started training. So nearly five years ago. So nearly five years ago, I'd never stepped foot in a gym. And now I have this bloody worldwide multi-million dollar conglomerate. So if if I can do it, you can do it too. That's all I want to tell you. You know, I don't have anything special. I just, the thing that I have that's special is I have an incredible work ethic. I work harder than anyone I know. I am driven to work hard and I have more energy. I suffer from too much motivation. I have more energy in my little finger than most people have in their entire body. So um, if you want to build something spectacular as well, you just have to double down and commit, give up your excuses and just fucking do it. Seriously, just do it. That's what I did. I just bloody well did it. Okay, a couple more questions. There's loads more coming in. Um, let me just see. I'll choose the best ones. Well, there's a really good one. Jojo Andrews, what drives you in everything you do? Work, family, training, etc. You know what, Jojo? There's nothing, no, there's not one thing that drives me except that I am, if I'm completely honest, I am driven beyond anything I, I can even think about or describe by a desire for things to be done right. I have this need for things to be done the best way that they can be done. So when I'm lifting in the gym, I have to lift the heaviest I can lift. I can't leave that gym feeling like I had more to give. I can't, you know, whenever I'm I'm building this business, I am driven to do more. I am driven to be the best I can possibly be in whatever it is I'm interested in. And then whenever I cease to be interested anymore, like yoga, I don't do yoga anymore. But when I did yoga, I was driven to be the best yoga teacher that existed. I was driven to be able to do press handstands and advanced arm balances and back bends and to be the best yogi that I could be. Not the best yogi in the world, but the best that I could possibly be. So I cannot leave anything on the table. I can't leave anything on the table. If I'm interested in something and I'm pursuing it, I'm pursuing it with every fiber of my soul. And I don't try to be that way. I just am that way. I have a need, a desire, a drive to be the best that I can be. And again, it's not competitive. It's not to be better than everyone else. I don't give a shit about anyone else. I don't look at anyone else. I never compare myself to anyone else in the industry, which is what makes me unique. I don't look at what anyone else in the industry is doing because no one is doing what I'm doing. I'm the only person in the health and fitness sphere who is doing the who's doing the company in health and fitness on the online world the way I'm doing it. No one else is doing it like me. And that's because I don't look at anyone else. I just keep my eyes in my own lane and I just keep forging ahead. So I'm just driven to be the best that I can possibly be. And I know that's probably a very shitty answer, but it's the only one that I can come up with. <laughs> um, right. A uh, couple more. Drem, Drema McCrory. How did you survive the early years with kids close in age? You are superwoman. Honestly, I really barely survived. And that's the honest to God's truth. I think I only survived because I of what I've just talked about. I am strong and capable and hardworking. Because let me tell you, when I, I had four children under the age of six at one point, and whenever my my fourth was born, Corey was Corey was five. Actually, whenever Jack was born, Corey was five, and he turned six shortly afterwards. Um, so what'll happen is Jack will turn ten in October, and then Corey will turn sixteen in uh, November. So for a month, I had four children under the age of five, which is pretty fucking crazy whenever you think about it. And the only way that I got through it was by luck, I think, and. 
uh, I don't know how I got through it. It was so hard. But I think what I did was I never, ever, ever tried to control my kids. I, I never, I tried not to stress if, you know, they didn't go down for an, a nap at the time they were supposed to, or they woke up early in the morning, or they were awake in the night, or they were sick, or they were crying. I just always tried to say, you know what, this too shall pass. Like, and if they, if they were up at 4am because of something, well, I just lay on the couch and watch TV with them and just was like, well, we're up at 4am. I think I always tried to accept the what is. It was really, really, really hard. Don't get me wrong. And I did a lot of suffering and a lot of internal cursing and fucking the wee shitty wee bastards and calling them all the names of the day. But at the end of the day, I just tried to accept the what is. I knew that time would pass. I knew that it was messy and complicated and imperfect. And I just let it be messy and imperfect and and as uncomplicated as it could be. And I was honest with them as well. And I, I said, mommy's really tired and mommy's finding it really, really hard to cope right now. And mommy feels like strangling you, you little bastard. Um, no, I didn't actually say that, but I felt like saying that. So I, and I, sometimes I would sneak out into the back porch. I'm not even joking. And I would hide from them and I would drink. I would drink. I would drink alcohol. I would like grab a couple of beers from the fridge and I would go in there and I would literally pick a beer up and I would down it really, really quickly. This is at maybe 5 p.m., you know, kind of the witching hour. I would down a beer at 5 p.m. and then I would pick up the next one and I would drink it as slowly as I could and I would hear, mommy, mommy, mommy. Like I never left them unsafe, but you know, they'd be like, where's mommy? And as long as I could hear them and they weren't screaming, then I knew they were fine. They were just like in the next room. Sometimes I used to sit in the back porch and drink and then I came out and it was like, happy mommy was here you know because you know with a couple of beers in you the alcohol hits your blood you're much nicer and story time was so much more pleasant for everybody and I really began to understand alcoholics at that time I truly did because sometimes alcohol was actually the only way I could get through because Raising children requires an enormous amount of emotional strength. I used to say to people, it's not the physical work required in, in raising children. It's the emotional work required in raising children. They are emotionally exhausting. And it takes a huge amount of resilience to keep your temper and to say, Shh, of course, darling, no problem at all. And I don't know, I just one foot in front of the other one day after the next, you know, my husband was zero fucking help. He never, never was here to help. He was always working. And so I just, you know, I just did the best that I could. And I absolutely was not perfect. But you know what? I never tried to be. I accepted the fact that I was imperfect and I did the best that I could possibly do. And I just accepted whatever. Oh, I'm hitting the table with my phone. Um, I just accepted whatever came up every day. Uh, okay. I've only got time for really one more question. So, uh, okay. This is a really good question to finish with. Amanda Ogden is asking, do you get a sense of achievement with all the people you help? Now, this is an interesting one. It's funny, like anything in the world, the more you have of something, the less you value it. So I'm not saying that I don't value how much I help people and how many lives I'm able to touch and how many women and men and people I'm able to affect. But certainly you do become, I was going to say you become numb to it. You don't become numb to it, but it becomes normal. So it ceases to be as exciting as it was in the beginning. And, you know, I have people every day in my Facebook group, you know, literally thanking me for changing their life, thanking me for saving their relationship, you know, pouring their hearts out in these, these messages and stories of how the programs and whatever has have changed their life. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Kim Constable. But here's here's a funny thing that happens, right? In the beginning, I actually would have accepted that praise and I would have been like, oh my God, this woman said that, you know, this, I did this and this, oh, they're, they're loving it. And they're, you know, you really, you would have been so happy that people who purchased your programs were loving it and getting value from it. And that would have been, you know, so, would have made it all worthwhile. But then what you realize when you're four years down the line and, you know, we've sold over a hundred thousand programs in four years, and never mind all the free ones that we've, um, you know, the people have downloaded as well. What you realize after 100,000 programs sold is that it's not me. It's not me that does. It's not me that that actually is, is the one 
that they should be thanking. It's it's them. I don't do the work. They do the work. So whenever people say, and how, how can I reframe that better? Whenever people say, thank you, Kim Constable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I smile and I say, oh, that's really nice. But inside I go, that wasn't me. That wasn't me. That was them. They did that. You know, I just provided the program. I just, I, all I did was write a program. I, all I did was write buns and guns and, and, you know, and I don't want to belittle it and be like, oh, I just, I'm just so humble. And I don't, you know, I really didn't do anything at all. It was nothing. Like it wasn't nothing because I have built this big company and, you know, I did employ a private chef who was able to write the recipes, which made them extra specially good. So I can't say it was nothing because it was something. But all, all I can do is there are many people over the world who are writing amazing programs, who are training people in the gym, who are doing amazing things, but no one knows about them. And so what I do isn't any more amazing than anyone else. Certainly not more. There's far better trainers, I'm sure, out there than me. But what I am better at than most people is sales. I'm a salesperson. I understand people. I understand sales. I understand how to sell. So it's not that I am the world's best trainer. It's not that I am amazing at writing programs or anything like that or inspiring or all of these things that people say that I am. It's that I'm actually an amazing salesperson. I managed to get my program in front of them and persuade them to part with $97 to purchase it. And so then, but millions of people buy my programs and never, ever, ever complete them. They never even open them. They never even download them. So that person, I, I, they were looking for something and I happened through a bit of smart marketing to get my offering in front of them and make it look attractive. So they took the plunge and they followed up because here is the hard reality. It doesn't matter what program you follow. What will get you results is consistency, not perfection. You can follow my program. You can follow Jay Cutler's program, Natalia Mello's program, Angelica Tashira's program, Laura Hutchinson's program. You can follow anyone's program and get results if you just remain consistent for long enough. So it's really not me or my program or what I did. It's it's that the person showed up, applied themselves, applied themselves consistently and got results. And the reason why I make my programs really, really, really hard is because I know when you do hard shit, and this brings us back to the first question about the bikini show, whenever you do hard shit, you come out of the end of it feeling like fucking superwoman. You feel that you are an entirely different person because of this hard thing that you did. Adversity is how we live. It's how we feel alive as human beings. We're adversity seekers. So if you overcome adversity, you feel like you can do anything. So I make my programs really hard so that people, when they do complete them, they feel like they've overcome something really, really, really hard and that makes them feel good about them. But they think it's me. They think it's me providing the program that has caused it, but they don't realize it wasn't me. It was just them. I'm not any better trainer than anyone else. I'm just a better salesperson. So um, so whenever then people say to me, do you really feel like you've touched loads of lives? And God, you must like just look at your life now and look at everything you've built and feel like they imagine that, you know, and I used to feel this too. I used to think that I would, I used to look at people who built these massive companies and think, God, they must just like feel amazing. They must just look at this huge company they built and all of this work and just feel like the, the, the most incredible incredible person in the world. And then you realize they don't because I don't, I really, I was walking down the garden earlier on in my socks with my feet shoved into my child's flip-flops sliders, you know, looking kind of with my hair in a floppy bun because it wasn't tight enough, hanging off my head, carrying a water can, watering can to water my tomatoes, you know? And I was doing that five years ago. I, I like, nothing has really changed. Yes, I have more money. Yes, I have more opportunity. Yes, I, I have the chance to, you know, obviously meet incredible people. But really, I don't feel any different. And I don't really feel like I've built this massive big company. I go into the office sometimes and all the all the girls are there and I chat away to them. I sit down, I throw my feet up in the desk and somebody makes me a coffee and I'm chatting away to them and cursing and swearing and we're all chatting about our boyfriends or our vaginal dryness or nobody joking, but you know, shit like that. And and then I and then I leave and I'm like, right, see you later. And they're all like, bye, see you later. And, I, and the other day I walked down the stairs and I had this moment of, shit, they all work for me. I'm the boss. 
Like I, I feel when I go into the office and I'm just like, I'm just there. I'm just one of the girls. I don't really feel like I'm the boss. I just feel like, like this is an office that I work in and we all work in there together. I actually feel like someone else is the boss. It's so strange. So it never feels like you think it's going to feel. It doesn't feel that way. You don't feel like you've made it. You know, you never, I don't think you'll, I don't think I'll ever feel like I've made it. There are moments when I appreciate it. Moments when I drop 60 grand on a holiday and I go, fuck, like, let me tell you, I, I fucking made it. Like, you know, but, but even then, but still like, it's only when things like that happen that you really think, okay, this, you know, the hard work is worth it. But otherwise you really don't feel any different. You really, really, really don't feel any different. I'm sorry if that's a disappointing answer, but it's true. Um, you just got to keep your head down, keep working and keep doing the best you can do and hope that you can, you know, that you'll be a good enough salesperson to, you know, to touch other people or to put your offering in front of other people and, um, and inspire them with, you know, with, with what you've got, inspire them to be better in their lives. And, and if I can do that, then I'm happy. I'm absolutely happy. And it's not even, I don't even want to touch people so that I can feel good about me. I want to touch people so they can feel good about them. You know, my Simon Sinek, start with why. My why is I want every woman to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and feel proud of what she sees and who she has become. And if you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and feel proud of what you see and you feel proud of who you have become and I have helped you in some way through one of my product offerings to, to, to have that, then my work is done. My work is done. That's all I want. I want that for you because I know how that feels because I, I have that and I know how I felt before I had it and I know how I feel now that I have it. The self-esteem is palpable and it's life-changing and I want you to have that too. So that's my why and that's why I do what I do and that is how I feel whenever I touch people's lives. Yeah, what a great episode. That was amazing. Um, I, I've just gone over the hour. I try to keep these now to 60 minutes because I get people complaining that I'm, I do 60 minutes cardio and whenever you go over the hour, it means that I have to like listen to the end of it another time. So try and keep it within 60 minutes. So I'm trying to keep it within 60 minutes. I think I've gone just over the 60 minutes. So I apologize if I have, but hopefully the extra minute or two was worth it. And hopefully you enjoyed this Q&A. This is actually one of my favorite episodes to, uh, to record. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me if you enjoyed this, please go to wherever you're listening to this podcast um, and write a review and tell me, did you enjoy this? Because if you enjoyed it, I'm going to do more of these because this was so fucking super easy and I loved it. And what I want you to do actually is I want you to send in your questions. Can you do, we're going to actually, um, we sent out an email recently asking people to reply with questions they would like answered on the podcast. And you guys were amazing at answering the questions. I'm going to ask Jamie Lee to send out another um, another email and I want you to respond to that email and tell me what you want to hear on the podcast and I'm going to answer your questions on the podcast and this is going to become like Kim's Q&A time. Uh, nobody cares work harder Q&A time. Uh, you know, a slap with a little bit of love as well. And don't forget to leave a review wherever you're listening to this. Send me a screenshot on Instagram at The Sculpted Vegan. You could be in with a chance of winning a Sculpted Vegan program. I'm going to announce August's winner in September and all that is left for me to say is have a wonderful rest of your week wherever you are. I love you so much. Thank you so much for listening. This was an honor and a pleasure as always. And I'll talk to you next week for another episode of the podcast. Bye for now.